Your Excellences, Honourable Ministers, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, the inspiring thing about standing in this room is that, directly or indirectly, between you, you account for the lives of hundreds of millions of people and millions of communities. And in that, we have a common interest, which is to bring the benefits of the SDGs into these communities. In our case, through the medium of telecommunications, digital innovation, and digital skills. Um, Professor Unwin said, do something, one thing different. Well, we did. We called ourselves Geeks Without Frontiers. It's a non-profit, but it's founded by three business entrepreneurs, telecom and space entrepreneurs. Um, and we run it as a business. The difference is that our shareholders are the communities that we serve. Our focus is connecting the global unconnected uh, through digital innovation and digital skills. We are advisors to local and national government. Uh, we work closely with the Federal Communications Commission in America on digital acceleration and disaster response and resilience. And we do a number of practical things on the ground, which I will speak about shortly. We also see ourselves as a bit of a think tank. And on this funding business, the SDG funding gap, for example, um, we're interested in uh, uh, we're researching some, uh, an equivalent of ESG credits in conjunction with um, some American universities and the IFC. We're interested in connecting the metaverse to the needs of local communities. We're interested in the value of community data on behalf of the community, which is something resembling universal basic income, which is something that comes with telecommunications. So these are some of the areas we're interested in. Um, now, about a year ago, we asked ourselves, how can we act most exponentially? We're a small organization um, headquartered in Washington, D.C., but operating in a number of countries. And along with um, Intel, we co-founded with Intel the N50 Alliance. So N50 stands for the next 50%. And as you can see, the lead partners are African Mobile Networks, Arizona State University, Amazon Web Services, Dell, American Tower Corporation, who have a big presence in Africa, GSMA, Intel, IBM Academy, SoftBank, T-Mobile, Worldwide Technology. This is the result of a year. We have about 110 partners, and the focus is on practical work on the ground, as well as think tank type activities. Just to give you three examples of things that we've done in the last year, and the fact that these are in different geo geographical locations is kind of irrelevant because they could be anywhere. So in with the Native American communities, uh, which are a materially underserved and unserved community in America, um, we've started something called the Indigenous Resilience Network. This is a good example. It's focused on helping, in this particular case, helping them to raise money which is due to them from the government, but they don't know how to access. How to build and create sustainable networks, digital skills, and workforce development. And this is where N50 becomes particularly powerful because the individual partners in N50 have many things to offer. They have indigenous skilled employees who want to work with their own communities, give something back. They have certification courses that can be used in workforce development. And this could be, as I say, in any country in the world. The fact that it is starting as a template in America is irrelevant. And this is what we're trying to do, create templates that can be extended universally. In Ukraine, Within one month of the start of the war in February last year, we had, with the help of six or seven N50 partners, created mobile communication units that were placed on the borders between Ukraine um, and uh, Poland um, and Romania. Um, the purpose of these being initially 
for mainly the women and children to have access to computers, mobile phones, charging points, heat, light, and information. Again, it's a template concept. We've, we're taking that concept to um, hurricane-torn Puerto Rico. Again, it could be anywhere. Uh, to try and build a hub-and-spoke hurricane-resistant communications network for the local community, run by the local community, on a sustainable basis. In Zambia, we have a project in a, a very small village called Luambo. This is a proof of concept. I'll talk about it a bit more later. But it's an attempt to address what the Honourable Minister for Ghana referred to, which is the rural challenge of low-cost, low-bandwidth, no-energy environments. How do you serve those communities? And as you know all too well, once you have any element of affordable, sustainable connectivity, remote education, remote medicine, uh, agricultural data, and so on, all become possible to those communities. So stepping back to the very big picture and using GSMA's own statistics, the picture we have for sub-Saharan Africa is 88% coverage, only half of which is taken up for affordability and digital skills issues. 50% of connectivity is 3G or less, so bandwidth restrictions on what services can be delivered. The majority of the population live in rural areas, and of course, um, connectivity is far less there. So there's this challenge for low cost, low bandwidth, no energy environments. Now, I wanted to zoom back out because the question here is about mobile communications in Africa. And yes, of course, we can talk about models, and I will do in a moment, but technology is exponential. Now, I'm sure none of you in this room go on to Instagram or TikTok. Maybe you do. But the point is, is that one person can have more followers in more countries in the world than the population of a small country. And this is the power of technology. Exponential technology, Moore's law, is driving everything in the telecom sector. Every 18 months, a chip is half the size, twice as powerful, and half the price. And this is what we're observing, particularly in the satellite world, where these new fleets of LEOs, which are promising within the next decade, direct to mobile connections at affordable prices. It's not here yet. We'll wait and see. But um, we wrote a model law called Dig Once. Now, Dig Once is an attempt to create a thought piece framework. The question being, how can we accelerate fiber and mobile into rural areas more quickly and for less money? The Federal Communications Commission uh, took this up and we spent 18 months working with them on a model law for every state in America. The challenge is, so, so the question is, technology is exponential. Law and regulation are linear. And with law and regulation, commercial interests weave their way around legacy regulatory policy and legal systems, making it very difficult for them to move. And that's totally understandable. So how do you release the power of exponential technology so that it can do its work? And how do you release it in such a way that it's affordable? And how do you release it in such a way that it can move more quickly? So Dig Once is a model law which explores this interface. It's to do with um, utility sharing. It's to do with mapping networks so that people know exactly what there is. It's to do with when somebody digs up a road or a new building, or an airport, or a railroad, that they have to put in 25-year capacity fiber, and they have to share it on a cost-plus basis. And if people create new infrastructure, the same thing applies. And things like network operating points have to be standardized. This is really, um, in brief, a way that technology can actually do what it's supposed to do, which is to be exponential and to serve the communities. So, um, and in America, um, the, the difficulties 
were really with the commercial interests that were invited around the negotiating table to decide what a model law would look like. And of course, commercial interests, which are very important to the economy of any country, don't want the change which is going to change the trajectory of their business. Similarly, we wrote another uh, thought piece with, um, in conjunction with some of the leading satellite players in the sector, looking at what is it that's holding back satellite connectivity? Why is it expensive? Could it be less expensive? Are there policy and regulatory measures that could be taken to change that? So here we're looking at things like transparency of uh, licensing. We're looking at blanket licensing. We're looking at um, anti-competitive practice across borders. And the question is, if you open up an environment, is that to the economic disadvantage of that environment or, or to its long-term advantage? Now, this is a question, and it has a different answer in different environments. But Satellite Connect is attempting to create an environment of consideration around long-term policies to release the capacity of satellite, and this is particularly relevant to Africa, um, particularly in rural areas, albeit that um, the affordability of satellite is not where it needs to be for rural areas to be able to take it up. So what are we doing in Luambo? It's, I'm not going to try and explain the diagram. It it's actually boils down to something very simple. We've created an architecture which uses very low-cost local towers. Um, African Mobile Networks is, has experience in this area, along with other um, players in that market. For about $10,000, you can create a local mast, solar-powered. On that mast goes a server to cache content. Between that server and local mobile phone users, there is zero rated traffic between the server and the mobile phone. This is obviously something that has to be agreed with the MNO. Um, this is not a new model in the sense of um, the, the concepts. What's new about it is that it is actually happening. And what we're interested in here is we have a low bandwidth environment, 2 or 3G. We have expensive internet. How do we reduce the cost of it? Towers are expensive. How do we reduce the cost of that? So the actual capex of the tower is less. It operates on a revenue sharing agreement with the main MNO so that um, the local player absorbs the capex, but uh, it has a revenue share with the, with the dominant MNO. And we are hoping that this model, uh, once we've measured it and uh, approved it, so it's, it's about a year old at the moment, um, will form the basis of a project that we have called TRIA, which is Transforming Rural Education in Africa. Um, and that is being um, done in conjunction with uh, a Zambian company called Mwabu, represented here by Ian McFadgen, who will tell you more about that project tomorrow. So um, what we're interested in here is a proof of concept that once measured and proved to be sustainable, affordable, we can start to roll out in many African countries. And so we're not interested solely in Luambo or Zambia. We're interested in an exponential model that is open source and can be used anywhere. And that's really going back to our roots of what Geeks and M50 is all about. We're, we're interested in open source exponential models that help to bring the SDGs into communities through effective, affordable, and sustainable connectivity. Thank you very much.